All right, you guys ready to get going on this next one? Cool, perfect. Okay, so now we're, we're starting to get into the good stuff. We're going through the organ systems, and we're going to start with the nervous system. And uh, I'm going to do the best I can with the time I have, but due to those time constraints, this is not going to be exhaustive. It's not going to be comprehensive, but hopefully it's going to give you a good introduction to, to start understanding the nervous system and how it's going to be tested on the MCAT. So first, as basic as it gets, what does the nervous system actually do? It's responsible for regulating the overall response of an organism to its environment. And it does so by integrating all sensory information or inputs and then coordinating an output. And we're going to have to take a few steps back to understand actually how this works. So we're going to start with the structural and the functional unit of the nervous system, which is the neuron. And then we'll move through. Uh, the rest of the things, the function of the neuron being based on the action potential and synaptic transmission. We'll talk about the supporting cast of the glial cells, and then we'll talk about, we'll build back up and talk about the overall organization of the nervous system. Okay, so to start out with just some structure, uh, basically the neuron itself is specialized for sending and receiving signals. Okay, we have a soma or a cell body. Soma is just the Latin word for body. That's where the, the nucleus is. That's where most of the organelles are, uh, as you'd expect. We have the dendrites, which are uh, specialized for receiving information. Dendrite comes from the Latin word meaning tree. And as you can see, it's kind of branched out like a tree here. And the point of that is to get as many synaptic connections with previous neurons as possible. Okay, and while the dendrite is specialized for receiving information, Everything about the axon is going to be specialized for sending information. So the neuron receives its information through the dendrites, through the soma or the cell body, and then it can project information to the next neuron in series through the axon. Okay, so we see right here we have this long axon. Uh, in humans, these can be up to about a meter in length. And then at the end of the axon, axon we're going to branch back out again to maximize our synaptic connections with the next neuron in series. And we call these terminal ends of the axon the synaptic bouton, or the synaptic terminal. And that's where the neurotransmitter release is going to happen. And that's where the communication actually occurs. Um, a few other things. The axon hillock is the very beginning of the axon. And we'll learn about its importance as we go. Okay, and same thing with the myelin. It's going to insulate the neuron. And then the myelin is separated by these nodes of Rondier. And again, we'll talk about all this stuff as we go through the lecture. Okay, so switching gears now, we're going to talk about the actual function and the physiology of the neuron, which is entirely based on the action potential. So this is the mechanism of neuronal communication. And a few important things to remember about this. It is unidirectional. It only travels down the axon, does not travel back up. It is non-decremental, meaning it does not decrease in strength as it goes. It's all or none. It's an electrical impulse, which physically means it's associated with the flux of ions across the cell membrane, creating electricity and an electrical impulse. And at the, the completion of the action potential, it's typically going to stimulate the release of neurotransmitters. Again, we'll go through all this as we go. But in order to actually understand the action potential, we again have to take a few more steps back and understand a little bit about the membrane potential itself and get into a little biochemistry of the membrane. So the membrane potential is defined as the difference in electrical potential across the cell membrane. And it's expressed as intracellular potential relative to extracellular potential. So in this uh, model cell I've drawn down here, I've put negative charges lining the intracellular side of the membrane and positive charges lining the extracellular side. So in this case, as occurs physiologically in the cells, the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside, and thus the membrane potential is also negative. And in the case of a neuron and other electrically excitable cells, it's typically going to be about negative 70 millivolts. That's a number you're going to want to remember if you haven't already. Uh, the membrane potential is determined by two main factors, one of which is the concentration gradient of charged molecules across the cell membrane, and the other of which is the relative permeability of the cell membrane to those charged molecules that we're referring to. 
As far as the concentration gradient goes, the main thing you're going to have to know for the MCAT is the sodium potassium ATPase. So this is primarily responsible for creating the concentration gradient, specifically with sodium and potassium. Uh, so the way this works, the sodium potassium ATPase, as you may already know, pumps three sodium ions outside of the cell and two potassium ions inside of the cell per ATP hydrolyzed. Okay, so this is an ATPase, and because it uses ATP, it's very energy dependent, which means it's also very oxygen dependent, and it's very sensitive to a lack of oxygen, which is very important. A couple of other things to note, it's electrogenic, which means you're pumping three positive charges outside of the cell per two positive charges you're pumping inside the cell, and that actually helps to create the negative membrane potential, as I was just talking about. And another very important aspect of the sodium potassium ATPase that's often overlooked is it actually helps to maintain the osmotic balance of the cell. So I just said we're pumping three positive charges out for two positive charges in, but that also means we're pumping three molecules of solute outside of the cell per two molecules of solute inside the cell. And if you understand osmosis, which hopefully you have a basic understanding, you know that water likes to follow solute. So we're pumping all this solute outside the cell. Water is going to follow to balance out the osmotic gradients on both sides of the semipermeable membrane. Okay, And that's also very important because it keeps water fluxing outside of the cell. All right, you guys have your eye clickers? Have we been doing that? I'll be asking you questions as we go. Ischemic means a lack of oxygen also, if you don't know. Give you guys a few more seconds. All right, pretty good. So uh, I've, I've done this intentionally, but you, you probably know that uh, the microscopic changes associated with ischemic injury is not an MCAT topic. But, like I said, I did this on purpose because I want you to take the information I've just given you and I want you to apply it to a new situation. Because in essence, that's what the MCAT is. They give you a bunch of answers in a passage and then they ask you a question that asks you to apply the information you just got with a little bit of background information that you're expected to know in order to answer the question. So what I just told you is the sodium potassium ATPase is very oxygen dependent, oxygen sensitive. So when we have ischemic injury, it's going to be one of the first things to lose function. And I was talking about the osmoregulatory properties. When it loses function, all of a sudden, all of a sudden sodium is allowed to flux inward. Okay? After sodium chloride is going to follow, and water is going to follow sodium chloride across the membrane, which is going to lead to cellular swelling. Uh, so good job to those of you who got this right, and hopefully because you're paying attention to that. But uh, you know, that's the kind of questions I'll be asking because I think that's a good simulation of what you're expected to do on the MCAT. And when you actually do get to the MCAT, there's not only the answers in the passage, but there's a lot of distracting and competing information. So my recommendation is do as much practice questions, practice passages, practice sections as you can because that helps you determine which information is relevant and which information is distracting. So that's my two cents on that. Okay, and there's the explanation I just gave. Um, 
as far as the other answer choices goes, apoptosis, it's probably a word you recognize, something you need to know. It's an energy dependent process and it's actually not the main mechanism of cell injury in ischemia. Uh, enzymatic degradation of cellular components, that comes later after the, the lysosomal membranes rupture and nuclear degeneration also comes later. Again, that's kind of stuff you're not expected to know unless you're, you know, prompted by the passage. So that was a little detour. Let's get back to the, the main focus. Uh, the second part of the membrane potential is the relative permeability of the cell membrane to the ions in question. So like I just said, the sodium potassium ATPase helps to set the concentration gradients, but the, the second relevant point is that it's very important about how permeable the cell is to those ions that have been set to a concentration gradient. And the important thing to know for MCAT purposes is the potassium leak channel. Okay, as the name suggests, the potassium leak channel allows potassium ions to leak across the membrane. And because the sodium potassium ATPase has just pumped a bunch of potassium in the cell, it's going to want to travel down its concentration gradient and it's going to want to exit the cell. Okay, you're taking positive charge and you're allowing it to exit the cell. That helps the intracellular side become more negative relative to the extracellular side. But an important thing here, and as you can probably, um, as you can probably figure out on your own, as this positive charge starts to exit the cell and the intracellular side becomes more negative, you're actually going to get an electrical gradient that's going to attempt to pull the positive charge back in the cell, which is also very important. And it turns out that the point at which the electrical gradient forcing the positive charge back in the cell and the chemical gradient forcing the positive charge potassium out of the cell, the point at which those two are equal and opposite and balance each other out is the equilibrium potential for the ion that you're talking about, in this case, potassium. Okay, so at, at the equilibrium potential, once that's reached, there's going to be no net flux of ions across the membrane, which means ions will be moving, but any that move out will be balanced by some that move in. Okay, so no net flux. And uh, this, uh, the calculation of this equilibrium potential for a given ion is done by the Nernst equation, which is more biochemistry, but I've included it in here because it is MCAT relevant and you might need to memorize this at some point. So the thing about the Nernst equation, it's for one ion at a time. It's, it's only relevant for isolating one ion. And you can calculate it for each ion individually, which these are uh, estimated uh, potentials of each ion. And I've highlighted potassium in yellow because that's going to be the most physiologically re relevant because the cell is most permeable to potassium because of the potassium leak channel. And what that means is that the overall membrane potential is going to be skewed toward the membrane potential or the equilibrium potential of potassium. It's going to have the greatest effect on membrane potential because it's the most permeable. Okay, calcium very positive, sodium positive 160, chloride also pretty permeable, it's around negative 70, which is around resting membrane potential, but potassium, because of the leak channel, is again the most important. So if you want to start combining multiple ions and actually figure out the resting membrane potential, you use an equation called the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. Uh, Technically, this is MCAT testable material. I think it's lower yield than Nernst equation, but I mean, if you want to memorize this, go ahead. What this does is it factors in the permeability, P, of each ion in question, and it uses that to determine the overall membrane potential when you're talking about multiple ions. And again, for electrically excitable cells, we're going to get a number about negative 70 millivolts. So that was kind of a lot about the, the basics of membrane permeability and ionic flux. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about that, if you're kind of lost right now, uh, Mike did a great job of explaining kind of the basics of the membrane and how ions flux across it in his syllabus chapter. So I didn't have time to cover all that, but if you need a little more background, that's, that's going to be a good resource. But with all that said, we can move into the action potential, which is the main focus of the physiology of the neuron.
A little bit of terminology that you might know. Uh, depolarization refers to the upstroke of the action potential, that's this phase. Repolarization is in the opposite, that's when it's coming back down, back toward resting membrane potential, becoming more negative. Hyperpolarization, uh, in the course of the action potential, the membrane potential actually goes past resting membrane potential and becomes more negative. That can be called an undershoot or a hyperpolarization phase. Threshold, we're going to talk about in a moment, but threshold is the point that after which that is achieved, uh, the action potential is inevitable. Uh, specifically, threshold must occur at the axon hillock. And refractory period, we're also going to talk about that a little more, but that's the, the point in time where a new action potential can't be generated because of the, the physiology of the ion channels themselves, and we'll go over that. So, first up, threshold. So, in order to generate an action potential, the cell actually has to reach threshold, like I said, at the axon hillock, which for neurons is about negative, five, uh, negative 55 millivolts. And it reaches a threshold from things called graded potentials. So when other neurons are synapsing on the dendrites and the cell body, they create graded potentials. And they're called graded because they can differ in strength and they can differ in um, whether they're excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, so I've kind of attempted to show that. We have some excitatory postsynaptic potentials or EPSPs, and up here would be an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, which would make the cell more negative and more difficult to reach threshold. Okay, but the main thing about graded potential is you need to know that the summation of them is important. So one graded potential by itself is probably not going to be enough to reach threshold. You need multiple that are uh, dispersed throughout space and time. As I say, spatial and temporal summation. So spatial, you have simultaneous uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials occurring at different spots on the dendrites or the cell body. And then temporal, after a little bit of time has passed, if it's sufficiently small amount of time, you can start to add on new potentials on the, the previous potential. And these have to happen very rapidly. But if they do, as I show delta T, and you get more, you can achieve threshold potential at the axon hillock, which then triggers the action potential. All right, another question. A few more seconds. All right, good. So I haven't actually told you this yet, but you know, hopefully you're either remembering this from some other class or you're adapting the information I have told you. So the correct answer is B, uh, the upstroke of the action potential. So I tell you that tetrodotoxin is a voltage-gated sodium channel blocker, and I ask which phase of the action potential will this affect? So pretending that you didn't know that uh, the upstroke is mediated by the influx of sodium, you could easily figure this out. Because as we've gone over, the equilibrium potential of sodium is positive 60. So if the membrane becomes more permeable to sodium, it will have a larger effect on the overall membrane potential of the cell and therefore starting from negative 70, the membrane potential will have to become more positive and closer to that of sodium. Okay, and the only phase of this graph that goes up toward a positive membrane potential is B, and that's why that is the correct answer.
So also, I'm like a huge nerd, and I think this stuff is really cool. So tetrodotoxin is from the, the Japanese puffer fish, and you can get a certain type of sushi that I believe is called fugu. And because it's got this uh, sodium channel inhibitory property, if it's prepared just right, as you eat it, your mouth will start to tingle and get that kind of pins and needles numb feeling. Pretty cool. But if it's prepared incorrectly, then you'll get a headache, you'll get dizzy, you'll start vomiting, you'll be very nauseous, and you might die. So, you know, choice is yours. You can't get it in the United States. All right, so as I say, tetrodotoxin, as well as actually lidocaine, the local anesthetic, which explains the, the numbing properties, and certain anti-epileptics like phenytoin can inhibit the voltage-gated sodium channel and therefore inhibit action potentials and lead to either numbness or, in the case of anti-epileptics, hopefully decrease the overall neuronal excitability and decrease seizure activity. So basically what I was just saying, the depolarization phase, the upstroke of the action potential, is mediated by a voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay, as you open this channel, because of the concentration gradient created by the sodium-potassium pump, sodium will flux inward, raising the membrane potential. Okay, it'll get all the way up to maybe positive 30, positive 40. Okay, here's the, the puffer fish. Here's some lidocaine. The next phase of the action potential is the repolarization and hyperpolarization phase. So two very important things are going to happen in this phase one of which is the closure of an inactivation gate on the voltage-gated sodium channel, okay? So I've, I've included a picture here. This, is, this could be the sodium channel. It's just kind of generic. But the sodium channel will have two gates. It will have an activation gate, which upon opening after reaching threshold, it will allow the influx of sodium ions. And it has an inactivation gate, which is this uh, ball and chain mechanism. So the inactivation gate, after... Uh, depolarization occurs and the cell reaches a certain uh, membrane potential, the inactivation gate will swing shut and prevent the further influx or efflux of sodium ions. Okay, and this inactivation gate will remain shut until the cell returns to or past resting membrane potential. That's very important. It will remain shut until the cell returns to resting membrane potential. The second important thing that accounts for the repolarization and hyperpolarization phase, okay, the first was sodium can no longer flux inward. The second is voltage-gated voltage -gated potassium channels will now open. And when voltage-gated potassium channels open because of the concentration gradient, potassium again will flux out of the cell and removing positive charge from the cell will return closer to resting membrane potential. And it will actually go a little bit past and it will reach the undershoot or the hyperpolarization phase right here. So remember what I said about the, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel. Okay, we have a split decision. This is good, this is kind of what I wanted. So again, something I haven't explicitly taught you yet, but hopefully you could pick on, on, on what I was trying to say. So, the correct answer is A, actually. Let's talk about that. 
So after you reach the top of an action potential, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel will close. Okay? And once it closes, even if the activation gate opens, as happens when you reach threshold, sodium ions will not be able to flux inward or outward because part of the channel is still closed, like I showed you that ball and chain mechanism. Okay, and I told you this will remain closed until you come back to resting membrane potential. So at that time, no matter how big of a stimulus the neuron gets, it will be unable to create a new action potential. Okay, so during the repolarization phase, as we're coming back down, the, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel is closed, 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 until you come back to resting membrane potential, at which point it opens. Okay, now the confusing part of the, about this question is you have this hyperpolarization phase, which is also known as a refractory period. However, at this point, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel is open, and it can open the activation gate if it gets a large enough stimulus. So an action potential at this point is still possible to be generated because the sodium channel is closed but ready to be opened at this point. Okay, um, Roman numeral two here is called the relative refractory period, where Roman numeral one is the absolute refractory period, and that's what I'm going to teach you next. So as I was saying, the absolute refractory period is caused by closure of inactivation gates of sodium channels, where a new action potential cannot be generated no matter how large the stimulus. Whereas the relative refractory period is the hyperpolarization phase or the undershoot mediated by the opening of voltage-gated potassium channels. So you're moving further away from threshold during the relative refractory period, but if you get a large enough stimulus, you can still achieve threshold and fire another action potential. So absolute refractory period, you absolutely cannot begin a new action potential relative refractory period, it is relatively more difficult to achieve a new action potential. All right, moving on. So that's the, that's the basic tracing of an action potential, but let's talk about how it actually propagates down the axon and sends a signal. So the propagation is due to the, the local spread of uh, the sodium influx and the change in membrane potential. So what's going to happen is sodium is going to come in, okay? This uh, positive membrane potential is then going to spread both ways along the axon, and it's going to trigger the opening of the next voltage-gated sodium channel in series, and so on and so forth down the axon like a domino effect. Now, part of the reason I was stressing the absolute refractory period so much is that this local sodium current can go bidirectional down the axon. But going backwards isn't going to open those sodium channels anymore because they're still in the absolute refractory period. So even though this positive charge is going to move this way also, okay, it's not going to matter because those sodium channels are still inactivated and therefore the action potential is unidirectional and only travels distally down the axon. Can't go back up. That's a pretty important concept, so I wanted to make sure you guys understood that. Uh, Non-decremental, it, it does not decrease in strength as it goes because as you move down the axon, you're opening new voltage-gated sodium channels, which all have the same effect on membrane potential. Basically, it's a domino effect all the way down the axon. And then all or none, you either get the whole thing and you get this domino effect of sodium channel opening, or you don't reach threshold and you don't get it at all. Okay, but it's a little more complicated than that, and you have to factor in things like uh, what myelination does to the axon. Okay, and this is uh, called saltatory conduction. This word saltatory comes from, I think, the Latin word for leap, the verb to leap. And it's called such because it appears as though the action potential leaps or jumps from node to node. These are the nodes of Rondier. Okay. Uh, let's see what I say about this. It occurs in myelinated axons. It occurs so because myelin increases membrane resistance. That's resistance to the leakage of current across the membrane. And it decreases membrane capacitance. So capacitance is basically how much charge you can store at a given location. 
You can't store a whole lot of charge due to the myelin, so charge will accumulate at the nodes of Ranvier where there is a capacitance difference. And then these are going to be where uh, most of the voltage-gated sodium channels are located, and this is why the action potential appears to jump from node to node. Okay, uh, I've included these because these are actually a good um, segue to like a, a physics topic. So you could see this in a, a physics passage or a biology passage. It's actually very important. In the central nervous system, myelination occurs from oligodendrocytes, and in the peripheral nervous system, it occurs from Schwann cells. We'll talk about those later. Uh, like I was saying, the nodes of Ranvier are the points where uh, the, most of the voltage-gated sodium channels are located, and this is where the flux across the membrane is going to occur. So sodium fluxes in, uh, that charge can then migrate down the axon, so importantly, it is traveling within the axon. It's not physically jumping out of the cell. It's traveling within the axon. It just can't escape due to the myelin. Okay, so it travels in the axon down to the next node of Ranvier where it can trigger voltage-gated sodium channels. The main function of this is to increase the conduction velocity of the action potential. Okay, and this, is, uh, this becomes apparent when you have demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis. Okay, so in those disorders, you have an uh, immune-mediated attack of the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, in the case of multiple sclerosis, and uh, that breaks down the myelin sheath. And without the myelin sheath, you now allow this positive charge to leak back across the membrane. So number one, that's gonna slow down your uh, conductance velocity, and number two, because you're allowing this current to leak across the membrane, so much current might leak across that by the time you get to the next node of Ranvier, you might not be able to initiate threshold potential and keep the action potential going. So it's almost as if you've set your dominoes too far apart, and at some point in the chain, they might not connect. All right, so... That's kind of the basics of the action potential, and we're going to kind of switch gears, and we're going to try to build back up now that we know the basic physiology of the neuron, and we're going to build back up into the, the organization of the nervous system. Never mind, we're going to talk about synaptic transmission first. Okay, so two basic types of synaptic transmission that you need to know. The electrical synapse, where um, an electrical potential can simply cross from one cell to the next. It does throw so through the, the flux of ions through gap junctions. Gap junctions are kind of porous connections between cells. Uh, the important thing about this, uh, it's bidirectional because a, a, a gap junction can't decide which way it wants to let things through. It's bidirectional. And the main thing you're going to see this in is cardiac myocytes. Okay, so when one myocyte gets depolarized and is stimulated to contract, that wave of depolarization can spread to the next myocyte in series, activating it. And this is responsible for the very organized contraction of the heart, which is obviously very important for its function. Uh, this also happens in some smooth muscle cells, but again, uh, the one you're likely to see is cardiac myocytes. And then as far as neuron goes, the one we're going to focus on today is the chemical synapse. And at the chemical synapse, it's called so because it's mediated by neurotransmitters. And this one, unlike the electrical synapse, is unidirectional. Neurotransmitters are released from the synaptic baton, and they uh, diffuse across the synaptic cleft, and they have to bind to membrane receptors to exert their function. Now, the membrane receptors are only located on the next cell in series. So you can't re-stimulate the original cell. You're only going in one direction. And let's talk a little bit about how it works. So the action potential is going to travel down the axon until it reaches the synaptic bouton. Okay, at this point, the change in membrane potential is going to open voltage-gated calcium channels. And the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels is going to cause the influx of calcium. And the influx of calcium is then going to cause the fusion of these synaptic vesicles with the plasma membrane. So this is going to exocytose, or release, the neurotransmitter that's stored within, which will then be allowed to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, 
bind its receptor on the next neuron or target cell in series and exert its function. Now, importantly, there also has to be a way to turn off this signaling. So uh, a main way that you're responsible for knowing as far as neurotransmitters go is they must be either degraded or removed from the synaptic cleft. So we'll talk about a little bit of that. One way is they can simply diffuse away from the cell. Uh, that occurs in things like nitric oxide, which we won't talk a whole lot about. But the, the main way is degradation. So in the case of acetylcholine, which we'll talk about in a bit, it's actually degraded within the synaptic cleft by an enzyme acetylcholine esterase. Uh, other neurotransmitters can have reuptake channels where they're removed by pumping them back into the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so various things that you're responsible for knowing. So let's talk a little bit about the neurotransmitters. Like I said, acetylcholine is probably the big one for you guys to know. Um, it's so important to know because it is the only neurotransmitter that exerts an effect at the neuromuscular junction. So that's where the nerve meets the muscle and can initiate a contraction. And that is mediated entirely by acetylcholine. At the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine will open ligand-gated sodium channels. So acetylcholine bind, and that binding of acetylcholine causes a conformational change that opens a channel and allows for the influx of sodium. That influx of sodium can then cause a depolarization and cause um, excit excitable activity within either the next neuron or the muscle. Okay, these ligand-gated sodium channels are called nicotinic sodium channels because they're also activated by nicotine and they're also called ionotropic because they work by letting ions in. Also important, you find these at the autonomic ganglia, which we'll talk about later in the lecture, but just foreshadowing there. Okay, there are actually two flavors of acetylcholine channels, the other of which is mediated by binding of a G-protein coupled receptor at the effector organ and the main thing to know about this is this is how you elicit a parasympathetic response. Again, we're kind of saving the uh, autonomics for the end of the lecture, but acetylcholine is the main uh, neurotransmitter to elicit the parasympathetic response. And when a, um, when a neurotransmitter binds a G-protein coupled receptor, instead of opening an ion channel, it's called metabotropic, and it goes through the, the second messenger system and all that good stuff that you'll learn in another lecture. And in the case of acetylcholine, it's called a muscarinic receptor because it is stimulated by the compound muscarine, which is found in certain mushrooms. Like I said before, very high yield to know, these are degraded by acetylcholine esterase. Uh, so acetylcholine, the main thing you're going to be asked about is the, its effects at the neuromuscular junction. It does have a role in the central nervous system, but it's important to know that acetylcholine is not the main neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, although it does have a role. The main excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is glutamate. It can bind multiple channels, but if you're asked about any of them, it'll probably be the NMDA receptor, which again is an ionotropic channel. And then the major inhibitory neurotransmitters in the central nervous system are glycine and GABA, or gamma aminobutyric acid. Glycine is going to be an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the spinal cord and the brainstem, whereas GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the rest of the central nervous system. Okay, important things about those, as opposed to the uh, excitatory stimuli we've been talking about that take the cell toward threshold, the inhibitory neurotransmitters are going to produce something called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And that is going to take the cell away from threshold potential, and it's going to make it more difficult to initiate an action potential, more difficult to reach the threshold potential. And that is the main physiology of why they are inhibitory. So a couple questions about neurotransmitters in general. 
All right, pretty good. So you picked up that I was trying to get you to think about acetylcholine. Uh, so uh, again, like most of my questions, the Botox itself probably isn't going to come up on the MCAT, but the, the foundational knowledge that I've been teaching about uh, the neurotransmitters will help you to answer this question. Okay, so the correct answer is B, inhibition of presynaptic acetylcholine release. And the only thing you really need to know is that I told you that Botox is a muscle relaxant. So I've also told you that acetylcholine is the only neurotransmitter that can excite a muscle cell. So in order to do the opposite, you have to somehow prevent acetylcholine from reaching the end of the neuromuscular junction and, and uh, exciting the muscle cell. So the only answer choice among these that can actually do that is the inhibition of presynaptic acetylcholine release. Okay, and the inhibition of presynaptic acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction is the mechanism of action of Botox, which if you're really nerdy, you might think is kind of cool. I sure do. Other cool things, uh, if you get the disease called botulism, which is from the same toxin that uh, Botox does, uh, you get paralysis all over your body, and it can be lethal if it reaches your diaphragm because then you can't breathe. And that's why you don't give honey to babies, because botulism grows in honey and babies can't defend themselves. Remember that. Okay, some of you said A, if you inhibit acetylcholine esterase, you're actually going to increase the amount of acetylcholine within the synapse because it's not being degraded, and that will lead to tetany or sustained muscle contraction, which is the exact opposite. And that's how uh, tetanus toxin works. Uh, actually, no, that's not how tetanus toxin works. That's how some nerve agents work. Um, inhibition of GABA and glycine release which are inhibitory, is how tetanus toxin works. Um, like I said, acetylcholinesterase, uh, the nerve agent sarin gas inhibits this and leads to sustained contraction. It's uh, not so fun to talk about because it's weaponized, but it's also somewhat interesting in a different way. And then uh, some good news is reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitors can actually be used beneficially in pharmacologic treatment of things like... Um, myasthenia gravis, where you need to create more acetylcholine within the synapse to help them initiate muscle contraction. So myasthenia gravis is caused by antibodies against the receptors at the neuromuscular junction. And by increasing the amount of acetylcholine in the synapse, you can outcompete the inhibitory antibodies and you can regain muscle function. Hmm, interesting. So, I hope you're laughing at my best attempt to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, the question, however, we didn't perform so well on. So, I've told you that GABA is inhibitory and elicits an inhibitory postsynaptic response by preventing the cell from achieving threshold potential. Okay, and if we're as I'm telling you, we're increasing uh, membrane permeability to a certain ion. So as we talked about with Nernst potential, if you increase permeability to an ion, it will have a greater effect on the membrane potential. Okay, so the answer is going to be B. 
If you increase the permeability to chloride, which has an inertia potential of about negative 70, which is below threshold potential, it will be more difficult to excite the cell. Okay. Hopefully now that I said that, you're starting to understand this. Okay, so that is the, the mechanism of action of GABA. So GABA receptors are ionotropic chloride channels. And then, like I said, increasing permeability to chloride makes it more difficult to achieve threshold. And that's the way that benzos like Xanax, barbiturates, and alcohol all exert central nervous system depressing effects. So think about that on Saturday nights. All right, now we're going to switch gears and build back up and talk about uh, the rest of the nervous system. So we're going to start with the glial cells. We've talked about the neuron. The glial cells are kind of the supporting cast. Uh, interestingly, the word glia comes from the Greek word for glue because uh, Virchow, the pathologist who discovered these cells, knew that they weren't neurons and knew that they didn't function like neurons. So he kind of proposed that these were the glue that held the rest of the nervous system together. And, you know, you can decide for yourself, but he was kind of on the right track. Uh, we've already talked about oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Oligodendrocytes are going to myelinate central nervous system axons, and Schwann cells are going to myelinate peripheral nervous system axons. Uh, one big difference is oligodendrocytes, as kind of depicted here, will actually branch out and myelinate multiple axons, whereas a Schwann cell will only myelinate one portion of one axon. Uh, back to the CNS, astrocytes have a lot of functions and probably a lot of yet undiscovered functions. Uh, one of the important ones for MCAT purposes is they help to form the blood-brain barrier because they uh, put out a bunch of astrocyte foot processes that line the capillaries within the central nervous system, and they control what goes in and what goes out, which is very important for keeping certain toxins out of the central nervous system. And because they're lining the capillaries, they also decide uh, about nutrients that come in, you know, such as glucose and things like that. So they're going to provide um, uh, nutrition for the neuron, and they're also going to provide a little bit of structural support. And also, interestingly, they do have a role in regulating neurotransmitter levels. Okay, ependymal cells, they're going to line the ventricles, which are the fluid-filled spaces in the, in the brain, and they're also going to line the central canal of the spinal cord. And they're going to produce cerebrospinal fluid to kind of help keep the brain more buoyant within the skull. Microglia are the macrophages of the central nervous system. And something that I think is super high yield is that these are of mesodermal origin. So you may not have learned about like the germ layers yet, but you will, and it's very important for the MCAT. So because microglia are basically macrophages in the central nervous system, they share an origin with other macrophage monocytes, which are from the hematopoietic stem cell lineage. And like those cells, they come from the mesoderm, which is in contrast to the rest of the cells that we're talking about, and the central nervous system, which all come from the ectoderm. So kind of a tip when you're studying, when you see something like this, where it's an exception to the rule, like everything in the brain is ectoderm, except for microglia, which are mesoderm, those are kind of the things that like to be tested on. So I think that's high yield. All right. This is a little better image of how they might actually interact with each other within the brain. We have ependymal cells lining a ventricle, secreting fluid, astrocytes interacting with the capillaries and the neurons, uh, oligodendrocytes myelinating multiple axons, and microglia just hanging out until something needs to be phagocytosed. So those are all the cells and how they work in the nervous system, but how does this nervous system actually interact to uh, do its job and help us interact with the world? So the, the first major division of the nervous system is the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, versus the peripheral nervous system, which is all other neural tissue. Okay, the central nervous system is responsible for the integration of sensory inputs and the coordination of motor outputs. Whereas the peripheral nervous system is basically responsible for relaying that information to and from this, uh, the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system can then be further subdivided into the sensory or afferent branch and the motor or efferent branch. So here's how I remembered this. The sensory or afferent branch, afferent information, ascends the spinal cord, 
okay? It's coming from sensory organ, it's going up toward the brain. Whereas the efferent motor branch will exit the spinal cord and it will go toward muscles to help you, you know, move and stuff. The efferent division itself can then be further subdivided into somatic and autonomic divisions. The somatic division is under voluntary control and it controls skeletal muscle. Whereas the autonomic division is involuntarily controlled and it controls things like cardiac muscle and smooth muscle and glands. So the easiest way to remember that is autonomic is automatic. It's out of your control. The autonomic nervous system can then be further subdivided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, which are very high yield for the MCAT and annoyingly so because there's various things to memorize. The best way to start with the sympathetic versus parasympathetic is to think about fight or flight versus rest and digest. So sympathetic nervous system, when you're in a life or death situation, you either need to fight or you need to flee and run away. Okay, so that gets you most of the function. It's going to increase blood flow to your muscles because you need to use them to run away. Um, it's going to decrease blood flow to your visceral organs because digesting the meal you just ate isn't very important when you're trying to run away from a bear or something. And it's going to dilate your pupils to take in more information, things like that. So that gets you most of the way. That helps you remember most of the function. Okay, whereas parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. It brings blood flow back to the viscera so you can digest the meal you just ate. Um, constricts the pupils because there's nothing really important going on to see and various things like that. Um, heart rate, respiration, things like that that are kind of intuitive to figure out. However, there are also things that don't really fall into this fight or flight versus rest and digest memory hook. And those are kind of the things that you're going to have to spend some time memorizing. So what I suggest is finding kind of a an image or a diagram that just lists out the functions of the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system. And you can go through it on your own and see, yes, this makes sense, fight or flight. No, this doesn't, I need to memorize. Uh, for example, things like uh, penile erection and ejaculation are controlled by the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system, respectively, which absolutely makes no sense based on fight or flight or rest and digest. So it's something that you'd probably have to memorize and it might come up on an exam. I'll show you a, kind of a, a picture of all the functions later. Okay, but for now, a couple of other high yield points about autonomic nervous system. At the, the ganglia, so the autonomic nervous system works in two neuron circuits. So you have neurons ali um, aligned in series, one after the other, and you have a neuron leaving the central nervous system. It will synapse at a ganglia, which is a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system where it will excite a second neuron to actually carry out the function. Okay. By the way, when a collection of uh, cell bodies is in the central nervous system, it's called a nucleus. In the peripheral nervous system, it's called a ganglia. And at these ganglia, you have nicotinic cholinergic signaling. So it's going to bind acetylcholine to nicotinic receptors, which causes ion influx, sodium influx, which will excite the next cell in series. Okay, and then after that, it starts to get different. So the sympathetic nervous system, for the most part, will undergo adrenergic signaling at the target organs. Okay, so you have uh, adrenaline is a synonym for epinephrine. So you have norepinephrine and epinephrine acting on target organs of the sympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine is mainly a neurotransmitter, whereas epinephrine is actually released from the adrenal medulla into the bloodstream and thus acts more like a hormone, but also helps to elicit a systemic sympathetic response. Okay, very high yield here. The adrenal medulla is a modified sympathetic ganglion comprised of neural tissue. Okay, so like other neural tissue, it's comprised of neural crest derivative, which is ectodermally derived. This is high yield because the adrenal cortex which has a completely different function, is mesodermally derived. So again, these exceptions to the rule are things you have to know. This should be pretty easy to know if you know the function of the adrenal medulla is to be a modified sympathetic ganglion and secrete um, a neurohormone epinephrine. You know, then it should be easy to, to follow along that it's also neurally derived. <laughs>
Back on the parasympathetic side, you have cholinergic signaling at the target organs, and this is going to be, like I alluded to before, muscarinic acetylcholinergic signaling, which works through G protein coupled with receptors and is responsible for initiation of second messenger cascades. Uh, what I want you to think about the sympathetic versus parasympathetic branches is a gas pedal and a brake pedal. So if you're driving along the highway and you have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, which you shouldn't do, but if you do, you could reach a steady speed. Okay, and there are t uh, a couple ways to change your speed. If you want to speed up, increase your velocity, you can either press down on the gas or take your foot off of the brake. In the same way, if you want to slow down, you can press down on the brake or take your foot off the gas. And I want you to think about sympathetic versus parasympathetic like this because most organs are dual innervated and the different uh, systems usually have opposite functions. So if you remove the parasympathetic signaling from an organ, you're going to shift the balance toward the sympathetic response. It's like either pressing down on the gas or taking your foot on the brake. There are always two ways to uh, skew this balance a little bit. Uh, like I was saying before, um, this is kind of a list of the different things it does. You guys can go through that on your own, see what makes sense, see what you need to memorize. Then a couple more application questions and then we'll, we'll be done. I agree, this was kind of a difficult question. Lots of things you need to take into account, but I did give you enough information to answer it. Uh, first thing, uh, if you don't already know what an antagonist versus an agonist is, uh, now is the time. Antagonist blocks a receptor, agonist uh, stimulates a receptor. So a muscarinic cholinergic antagonist. Things we need to know about this. Uh, I said this very quickly, but I did say that uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors are responsible for parasympathetic signaling. Okay, so if you block a muscarinic cholinergic receptor, you are blocking parasympathetic signaling. Okay, so if you take your foot off of the parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to skew it toward the sympathetic response. And that is basically what this question is getting at. Okay, well, part of the sympathetic response is an increase in heart rate. You know, the adrenaline flow increases your heart rate so you can fight or flee. Okay, and as I say here, antagonism of the parasympathetic nervous system has a sympathetic response. And uh, this increase in heart rate is actually still used clinically, and atropine can be given to rapidly increase a patient's heart rate. Again, atropine is probably not going to be in your test, but these concepts are important, and you could see an application question like this. One more. 
All right, good. So now you're getting the hang of these application questions. OK, so application questions are always more difficult than memorization questions. But they're the ones that get tested on the MCAT. And that's what's going to separate your score from everybody else taking the test. So propranolol, beta adrenergic antagonists, blocks adrenergic signaling, therefore decreases a sympathetic response and increases the parasympathetic response. And part of the parasympathetic response is constriction of the bronchioles, because you don't need to take in a whole lot of oxygen to run away from a bear, okay? versus the sympathetic response, where you do need to take in a lot of oxygen, you would be dilating your bronchioles. Some of you, if you have uh, asthma, you might know this already, but the main treatment for asthma is albuterol, which is a beta agonist, meaning it stimulates the beta receptors in the airway causing bronchodilation, which helps you breathe and helps relieve the symptoms of asthma. So just a, a couple application questions based on sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Remember, you can either reduce one, which skews the balance toward the other, or you can stimulate one, which obviously skews the balance in its favor. And then again, kind of go through that chart and see which of the ones make sense based on fight or flight and which of the ones you need to memorize. Here's just a overall organization of the nervous system, stuff we've already learned. And then uh, I'll be back next weekend, a couple lectures then. Make sure you show up, because I think my lectures are good. So hopefully you guys do too. Um, I, I hope you kind of got the feeling of what an application question feels like, where you don't think you know the answer, but if you break it down into what you do know, you can normally figure out the answer and kind of Becoming good at those questions takes a lot of practice. So my biggest tip to you guys is do as many practice questions and practice passages and full-length practice exams as you can. We don't have time for our practice passage, but hopefully we can get that to you guys. Questions, real quick? I know it was a lot. Okay, good. You guys understand everything? All right, come back next weekend. <laughs>